hopefully I'm back. Got disconnected. I was out at the um, grounds area trying to give you some pictures and my battery ran out, though I had a full charge battery. So hopefully you see me. Let me know if you see me. Say hi so I can continue. So I apologize. I wanted to try to at least get the devotion done. <clears throat> hopefully you saw some pictures. I was saying that my connection is weak. So good morning, Facebook. Good morning, Calvary Chapel Inland. I'm here at um, Marietta Hot Springs at a missions conference. And I tell you, I'm being blown away. The Lord's really ministering uh, to all of us here. Uh, something that really, really... Uh, ministered to me was a man named David from um, Syria and he was a part of an underground church and a church that um, is thriving over there and <clears throat> I guess he warned them that there could be a possibility of uh, death in some of the Christians that they're persecuting and so he gave them an opportunity to to leave um, and most of them stayed and requested just one thing from him that when they die that somebody take their body and bury it for them because they have no family no burial grounds and so what the church did was their first building as a church was in a cemetery they created tombs for those that would be martyred for Christ and I was just like wow the first church building was a tomb because <clears throat> they know that they're going to die for the gospel message so but I had to come back into the room, plug my phone in. For some reason, I'm having problems with my phone. It, it's telling itself that the battery's dead. So um, once I plugged it in, it went right back to charging. So let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. And I'll at least try to get the message in. And if I can, I'll run out and give you some pictures of the grounds while it's still connected. Hopefully that, that will work. So hi, Katie. Good to see you there, Christina. Anybody from Calvary Chapel? I know that you guys are there gathered together. I saw Russ's name there. Hopefully you are. Well, let's pray. Father, we do pray for this connection, Lord, in this uh, Devo 30, Lord, that you would just bless it. Lord, keep the connection with Facebook Live. And Lord, just minister to our hearts as we look at Jesus, who is our high priest. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> we have to go back to chapter 4 to truly understand it. Um, Paul uh, encouraged us, uh, us about Jesus being the high priest and that we can go boldly into the throne room of grace and mercy uh, to obtain that if we have a need for it. Um, and he continues on with that thought in chapter 5 for every, verse 1, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifice for sins. Uh, so he's defining what a high priest uh, did back in the Old Testament, their job requirement, and um, how they appointed them. Of course, uh, men would appoint high priests, so men appointing men uh, to minister uh, the gifts and the sacrifices of the sins of the people. I like that word little their gifts, uh, both gifts and sacrifices. So the priests would take <clears throat> the gifts from the people and offer it unto God, uh, not their tithes, but if the Lord blessed their their uh, crops, then they would give above that, and it was a pleasure to give back to the Lord uh, what he has blessed them with, but also the sacrifices that were offered up for their sins. So he's talking about the priesthood back in the Old Testament, which came from Aaron, and he's giving us that example because he's going to then tie it together with Jesus being our high priest. Verse 2, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also beset by weakness. So a good high priest would, would understand that he too struggles in life, and so when he approaches those that are coming, he needs to counsel with. He would also uh, be able to minister to them, uh, understanding that they're ignorant and they're also weak of these things because he himself is weak. Because of this, he is required as for 
the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man takes his honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. And the priesthood began with Aaron, Moses' brother. You find that back in Ezekiel chapter 28. Now we come to verse 5, and he mentions um, Melchizedek. Uh, you'll find him in Genesis um, pertaining to him. Someone's knocking on my door, trying to get in. Occupied. <laughs> This is interesting. <laughs> Verse 5, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him. So like Aaron and his descendants who were selected by men to be high priest, so Jesus was selected also by the Father God to be high priest. So he was selected by God himself who said, and he quotes from Psalms 2 verse 7, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, he doesn't quote the whole scripture, but he quotes the reference that pertains to Jesus Christ as evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. He also quotes from Psalms 110, as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You'll find the story of Melchizedek in the Old Testament. He was uh, that king, that brought uh, communion to, to Abraham, and then Abraham paid a tithe uh, to Melchizedek. Uh, Paul's going to talk more about Melchizedek in chapter 7 at length, and so I'm going to touch on it when we get there. Uh, some believe that Jesus could be a, a Melchizedek, a typology of it, of him, or that uh, Melchizedek literally was Jesus kind of pre-incarnate. Uh, so you might have to do some research there and decide for yourself. He goes on in verse 7. Actually, verse 7, 8, 9, and 10 are a little difficult to understand, and there's still debate over the interpretation here. He says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, a couple of things as we look at those verses uh, that, that you just have to draw, and hopefully you have your Bibles and you can look at them uh, with me. A couple of things is that he learned. Did Jesus have to learn something? Another thing, that he was perfected. Uh, and, and these words here, uh, kind of uh, uh, confuse us uh, pertaining to Jesus because we thought he's God and he knows all things. Uh, there's nothing surely he needs to learn or I thought he was perfect without sin. How could you perfect uh, God in the flesh? And so there's debate on this. I was reading um, McGee's commentary and he said, uh, it's a mystery to me. I'm not sure what it is really saying here. Now, I'm not sure either. I can only give you my opinion. And, and looking at what's going on here, we know that Jesus, as God, cannot learn anything. He knows all things and that he is perfect. So he must be talking about something else. We know that God became flesh and dwelt among us. He walked among men. So I kind of believe and lean towards that Jesus experienced, not necessarily learned, but he experienced obedience, like we have to be obedient, though it's very difficult for us because of the flesh, the will. And yet Jesus experienced that obedience that comes by denying oneself. I think that that could be what uh, the writer is speaking of here. And, and then the perfect sacrifice. <clears throat> Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that was offered up on the cross. It was no lamb. Uh, there was no man that could do it. It had to be God in the in the flesh. Interesting, uh, I learned something here at the pastors, I mean, at the missions conference. Uh, I was talking to a Jewish couple who were in Israel, and they invited us to, to go out there and visit them uh, this next year. We'll have to pray about that one. But um, they were sharing with us all the different beliefs that Jews have today. And many of them don't even believe that there's sin they don't believe in sin. They don't believe that we're sinners and that we're in need of a Savior. And, and <laughs> my question immediately was, well, how do they reconcile the Old Testament? How do they reconcile the sacrifices and the offerings to God, the Day of Atonement? And 
They said they don't. They don't agree with it. Then they're very secular. So an interesting challenge for those that are missionaries in Israel today. But do some research there, and you might come up with something different. Or if you uh, have heard something different, write it down there. I'd like to hear it. Uh, get your ideas uh, pertaining to uh, the interpretation of uh, the son, yet he learned obedient by the things which he suffered. Um, we can apply it to ourselves, some application. We too can learn obedience by the sufferings because as we suffer, we learn to be obedient through the sufferings, to deny the flesh, to deny our will. And so we suffer through those things and, and we're learning something. Uh, we're learning about ourselves, we're learning about God, we're, we're learning about life, we're learning about eternal life. And those are things that we, we can learn as we apply uh, the, the suffering aspect to learn to be perfect as our Savior. And let's close with verse 11 through 14. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. <clears throat> For though... By this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Now again, Hebrews is, seems to be written to Hebrews, Old Testament priest, uh, maybe the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and it could be that Paul is saying here is, look, you guys should be teachers. You should know the law of the Old Testament. You should be able to tie it in with the New Testament, the life of Christ. You should have a greater understanding than the normal person, but yet you, you don't. You don't. You have to be taught all over again. You're dull of hearing. Uh, you're missing out on the first principles of the oracles of God, and now you need milk again instead of solid food. Uh, 4, verse 13, everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. <clears throat> and that's the goal of, I believe, every true believer, is to have their senses sharpened, uh, not dulled, that... Um, their passion would be to learn more about their Savior Jesus Christ and, and what he suffered through and how he got through those things. And thus we become uh, mature in our faith. We have an understanding that others maybe um, do not have, but we do, and we become mature Christians in Christ Jesus. So he presents Jesus as the high priest, and in chapter 6 we're going to see that he's going to move on to uh, being mature uh, in the Lord. So we do have a high priest. And as we mentioned last week, he understands uh, our sufferings. He understands our pains and our infirmities. Um, and, and maybe that's how he learns about us, who we really are, how we really work, uh, what causes us to tick, you know, our very heart. Um, not that he needed to learn that, but to experience it so that he can minister to us even better. So that uh, will conclude that, but I really would like to show you guys it's a blessing being here. And so I'm going to try, I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I'm going to try to walk out of here and see if the connection sticks. If I lose it, then I'll have to, to save it. So hang on. Give you a picture of uh, what it looks like out here. I'm going to head over to the conference center myself right now. So this is where Virginia and I are staying. We're actually in that one room right there. <laughs> it's a beautiful room. And there's the uh, kitchen that we go and eat and fellowship with and some of the grounds. I wish I could show you the hot springs, but it's down there and I'm not going to walk all the way down there. It's this beautiful place. Thanks for praying for me, church. Appreciate it. God bless